probably addressed uh, quite a few of you before in different contexts. When I was a, a pundit and commentator on the financial crisis, and I'm now a minister, and therefore I have to watch more carefully what I say. Uh, but I, I have written about this, including a book, which I shamelessly promote, uh, which can't be unwritten, so my thoughts on what happened are, are out there. Um, and I don't propose to do what Gordon Brown is alleged to have done. You may remember at the beginning of the Labour government, various people drew attention to this rather left-wing track called the Red, Red Papers for Scotland. Anybody remember that? which he wrote actually with me, uh, and I think we were both slightly embarrassed about it, but there were rumours that various minions had been dispatched from the Treasury to buy up the remaining copies, so they <laughs> couldn't find in the hands of, of, of the public and the journalists. Well, I'm not proposing to do that. Um, but, but in this sort of new role, I, I do find it sometimes a bit surreal, because one of my jobs, which I guess is partly today, actually, is to receive the wisdom of other people and reports uh, and to do my ministerial thing and to nod and say how interesting and I will read it in my spare time. And um, a few weeks ago I, I was at one of these ceremonies where I duly received a report and promised to read it and actually my name was on the report that I was uh, promising to read. Um, uh, that was the, the, the Banking Commission ep episode. But anyway, I, I will try within those constraints to um, say a hopefully take the debate a little bit on. Um, I really want to just address sort of three policy issues, uh, one of which is the economic policy management, the macro policy issues which the government's inherited and how we are dealing with and could deal with it, something about bank lending as a constraint on economic activity and something about the structure of banks. But I, I think before that, just put it into context and the kind of things you've been discussing and the kind of things I wrote about in my book. I think those of us who have spoken and written a lot about this subject in the last few years have always been sort of groping for analogies and we've sort of, depending on the audience, we've switched between storms, earthquakes and heart attacks. And I think actually the, the latter, the medical, uh, metaphor is probably the one that comes closest to explaining what I think has happened. Uh, I mean, it's, it's you know, we, we have cyclical variations in the economy, which I've always seen as akin to attacks of flu. You, you know, you get high temperatures, they go down, the economies go up and down, you get overheating. But what actually happened in this financial crash was the equivalent of a heart attack, which has done major and permanent or semi-permanent damage. And this crisis isn't over. I mean, you know, the system is still on um, life support of various kinds. Um, so we're still living with the consequences of that massive shock. Uh, I won't um, devote a lot of time to how the shock happened. I mean, you've been talking about that. I'll just make one simple point. I mean, the conventional explanations are we had a combination of a, you know, out of control real estate bubble here in the United States and some other places. We had uh, extraordinary accumulation of personal indebtedness, which then had a reversal of behavior. And we had a highly over-leveraged banking system. And that's all common to most of the commentaries. I think the point that is often forgotten is that on almost every one of those, Britain was an extreme outlier. Uh, the, the property bubble in the UK, in terms of house prices in relation to historic trend, was quite exceptional by international standards. The level of consumer debt in relation to income, difficult thing to compare, but as far as we can measure it, uh, probably the highest in the developed world, and a very high, extraordinary percentage of banking assets in relation to GDP, not quite of Icelandic proportions, but heading in that direction. So the shock, the heart attack, was exceptionally severe in the UK, and we're living with those consequences. I mean, you know, we haven't died. I mean, the system hasn't died. We've had a life support system. Uh, we've had a combination of very aggressive monetary policy. We've had a devaluation. We've had fiscal policy, though actually in all the political debate, the role of fiscal policy seems to be wildly exaggerated. It's clearly discretionary fiscal policy has clearly played a part. And we're still alive. But, you know, a lot of damage has been done. Um, you know, we can measure this in different ways. The figures, the revised GDP figures out a few days ago suggested a fall last year of 6.5%. If we look at that in relation to trend growth, we're talking about the fact that we're now poorer 
by almost 10% relative to what would have been if trend growth had continued. And the issue has been and is, you know, how you absorb that big loss, that cost. And much of the debate around economic policy is about you know, how that 10% loss is now going to be paid for. I mean, essentially what happened, and of course, people in the private sector did pay part of that price. A lot of people lost their jobs. We had extreme contraction in parts of the manufacturing sector, but much of the pain, much of that cost has been absorbed by the government on its own books. And we're now faced with the question about how you, how you unwind it. And that's you know, the central issue about so-called structural deficit. I mean, I think of the structural deficit, try to put it in it's what I would sort of call common sense terms, that you know, what's happened is that we've had a sort of permanent loss of income as a result of the fact that the economy was structurally unbalanced uh, from the financial sector, from the housing market. Uh, we can't permanently fund this through government because otherwise we progress from a banking sub crisis to a sovereign debt crisis, we have to unwind it. And that's what the government's in the process of doing. Well, that leads on to the sort of first of the big questions I wanted to raise, which is about uh, macroeconomic policy and how we're trying to address that question. Uh, I mean, essentially what's happened, uh, we've taken a decision in the first few days of office to cut public spending by six billion on top of the fiscal tightening that was already taking place. And, and, and much of the public debate, infuriatingly, doesn't seem to acknowledge the fact that in this financial year there was already a fiscal tightening of 23 billion already in train. You know, we've added a fifth of the total fiscal tightening intended for this financial year. And the total amount's about just under 2% of GDP. And, you know, we have in the political world almost sort of hysterics over this 6 billion, which is actually ludicrous when you put it in the context of the wider influences on economic policy and the fiscal tightening that was already taking place. We can argue about whether it should have happened or when it should have happened. I think it was right. We don't really know the counterfactual story about what would have happened if we hadn't acted. I think, I think we are right in our judgment that if we hadn't acted, we may well have found ourselves subject to an attack on sovereign credibility of the country and what that then in turn means for the long-term cost of capital. We, we don't know the counterfactual story. We think we were right to take that move, even though in the context of this financial year, it was quite a modest piece of fiscal tightening. But the question we now have, which is the subject of day-to-day -day commentary, is how do we progress from a commitment to eliminating this structural deficit over a rather shorter period of time than the last government envisaged. Haven't yet done it, but we've announced our intention of doing it. How do you progress from that set of difficult policies, extremely difficult policies, to economic growth? And not just economic growth. I think this is a point that's overlooked. We're not, you know, no doubt you could contrive a set of policies that could reproduce a short-term burst of economic growth. You know, we, we, you know, pumping in liquidity in the economy, you could create a new real estate boom. To some extent we have, but people do argue that that's what quantitative easing has achieved. We, you know, we could achieve an artificial uh, boomlet through high property prices. Uh, no doubt it would be possible somehow to stimulate consumer borrowing and jack up consumer debt to even higher levels and get people spending. Uh, and no doubt we could re-inject some life into the banking sector and create some growth there. But this would be horribly unbalanced and it would reproduce many of the problems that we've, we've had. So what we're about is not merely progressing from fiscal austerity to growth, but growth in an economy that is rebalanced and where the emphasis is on business investment, on the production of tradables, um, on... Uh, within the tradable sector, shifting to manufacturing, creative industries, relative to financial services. So we're about restructuring as well as about growth per se. Um, the question is often put to me, and part of this debate, well, how do you, how do you get growth out of the current situation? You've got a, an economy that's um, hardly growing in a Western world that's facing serious difficulty. Um, business investment fell very heavily last year. Our know, men export markets are stagnant. How, how do you progress from uh, 
fiscal tightening and austerity to, to growth? I mean, the obvious answer is difficult. Uh, and I guess in practice, what we're talking about is a combination of demand and supply policies. Demand policies rest implicitly on aggressive monetary policy and the continuation of it. Of course, it's independent. It's not controlled by me or my political colleagues. But implicitly, there is an understanding that monetary policy will accommodate what we're trying to do and will help to sustain uh, aggregate demand. I mean, you may believe, no doubt, there will be an argument in this conference about whether there's a liquidity trap or not. But, but the assumption is that aggressive monetary policy can sustain demand. At the same time, uh, we have supply-side measures, and that's corporate tax measures, deregulation, uh, an aggressive approach to training, which all I get, all I hear from British industries, this is probably the major constraint on both inward investment and domestic companies expanding their activity. There's a but these are essentially long-term, medium-long-term. They're not going to create growth in the very short term. The key there is the supply of credit issue. And there is clearly a very vigorous debate going on as to how much the contraction of the banking sector is actually constraining production. Uh, and it's a debate that I think don't has, doesn't have a completely unambiguous answer. I and mean, the figures up to last month, well, May to May, suggest that the amount of net bank lending to business contracted by about 46 billion. And I guess that's a combination of uh, bank balance sheet um, changes, uh, fall in demand from the corporate sector, and actually the withdrawal of some banks. I mean, we've lost the Icelandics and others, they're just not lending. So that explains in different degrees, depending on what kind of growth accounting measures you use, that, that this loss of, of uh, bank credit but on the other side, there is almost the same amount, 42 billion, has been raised by the corporate sector from capital markets. And I think the story is basically is that most uh, larger companies are not having problems raising capital. They're raising them from capital markets fairly easily. And that if we have a bank uh, credit problem, it's very much within the small, medium-sized enterprise sector. And there's a similar debate going on in the United States. Ben Bonanco made some interesting comments about this a couple of days ago. But we have this sort of frustrating debate going on with the banks. It's a bit like one of these you know, pantomime routines where one's saying, oh, yes, you do, and oh, yes, you don't. You know, it's a, basically, the banks are telling us there isn't a problem. Uh, they're telling us that 80% of all their uh, loan requests are approved and that they're out there really working hard and trying to get lending going into the small, medium-sized sector. And on the other hand, if you go around and talk to the Federation of Small Businesses or the Institute of Directors or the CBI, they will tell you the exact opposite. And somewhere you know, in between the two, it, the two, the truth lies. But it is an extraordinary and very unsatisfactory debate, particularly if you're a policymaker like me. I mean, who do you believe? You know, is it entirely, as the banks would argue, that the business sector has got a perception problem, uh, or is it that the banks are just being disingenuous? You know, there is a, a really difficult practical question there. You know, what is going on? I mean, I do think there is a supply problem. I think it's fairly easily explained. If banks are now adjusting um, their lending policies in terms of risk aversion and clearly if you raise the hurdle fewer people want to jump over it the cost of borrowing is higher you reduce demand so there is a there is a demand problem uh, and a supply problem and they're interacting uh, and it it is actually and i think potentially a very very severe constraint and probably more than any other single factor could unless we deal with it uh, prevent recovery um, there are a whole lot of things coming down the track. The banks have got a big refinancing issue. There is the special liquidity screen withdrawal in 2012. If it goes according to schedule, all of those things will withdraw massive amounts of liquidity from the system unless there's some counteraction taken. And one of the big debates that we're now beginning to have and have to have is how do we translate the general slogans about macroprudential policy and countercyclical uh, 
uh, regime, how do we translate that into practice? Now we're at the bottom of the cycle as opposed to at the top. How does it work? Uh, do we use um, large-scale guarantees to reduce risk at the margin? Uh, do we use quantitative controls over lending? I mean, there is a big debate, unresolved, which we're in the middle of, in terms of how we reduce this constraint. So that's the banned lending issue. And I think thirdly and finally, I'd just like to say a few words about the other big policy question, which is how we stop all this happening again. I think many of us come from the line of argument, which we've heard from the Governor of the Bank of England many times, I certainly bought this argument, uh, that we have a structural problem, uh, that we have very, very large banks that uh, in practice, however much we may design new regimes, are too big to fail. Uh, and this then creates a fundamental problem of banks that are then ultimately dependent on the taxpayer, so you then have to address the, the issue of structure and size, or composition of banks. And in order to address that issue, um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer and myself have set up this banking commission, good independent-minded people, and we're looking to them to come up with answers to this basic question about how do you create a banking structure which is safe, uh, but which also performs other functions and is competitive. We've got a serious competitiveness problem, in, particularly in business lending. So there's the structural issue of that kind. In the meantime, uh, we've introduced a bank levy. Of course, this is partly about revenue, uh, but it's also about the basic principle that if the state um, insures uh, the banks, which is effectively what it does, uh, they should pay for it uh, in the same way that you pay for your car insurance. So we're seized of the fact that there is a big structural problem, not just a liquidity problem in the banking system, and are taking the first steps to dealing with it. We've only had 60 days, but I think that's a fair amount so far. Thank you.